Um, Julia, how did you get into dance or did dance find you? Where did it all begin? Began at home, listening to music. I think that's probably the first point. And um, listening to my brother's music and my sister's music um, and youth clubs at school. I had like an urge always to like, not party, but like jam at home or like at family parties. So that's kind of where the first kind of seed started. And then it was clubbing and going to clubs when you're like a teenager, going to clubs where you're not the right age. And then you're partying. And then when I was then, I got scouted in the club. And then they asked me to do a dance competition, modelling competition. And that's kind of how it started. So who inspired you to have a career in the arts or to start a career in the arts? I, don't, I wouldn't say that one person inspired me to have a career in the arts. I would say that it's something that, um, like I did classes after that fashion um, competition, dance show thing. I thought, oh, I can pick up choreography. And I thought, I'm not bad at this, actually. And then I did open classes in my hometown, Luton. And Eric John was doing like these street jazz <laughs> classes like every Wednesday, four pound, and it, like a gym, like a, is it a fitness first gym or something. And we used to like travel there, get a taxi. Me and my cousin, my best friend, would do like this four pound class for an hour. Doing that class, we would do, he would organise little little showcases in the town centre, in hospitals or in little community centres. So you'd have like these community showcases. And when I think back to it now, I think, oh, cringe. But actually it was a massive stepping stone for me because when we did that, I thought, actually I can pick up movement and I really enjoy it. And at that point, it was just before uni and I thought, you know what, maybe, yeah, I'm going to be a dancer. I thought, oh, this is what, I'm going to try and do this. That was like my little thing. And I said to my mum, I don't want to go to university. Let me, give me a year and I'll, you know... I'll, 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 let me try this dance thing. I think I'll, I want to do, I want to be a dancer. And, um, and she was like, no, go to uni. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So I went to university. She goes, study dance at university. And I, and I applied and I, I didn't get in for dance. And they, because I was like technique class, I was terrible, had no foundation whatsoever. Yeah, they offered me drama theatre performance studies and I studied French alongside it. And then subsequently going to France, I was able to study dance and, and all the extracurricular stuff that they do outside of uni, like productions and stuff, got me... Yeah, I just, like, I worked a lot in my parents' takeaway, and then I would use that money to, like, take class at Pineapple, or anywhere I could do a class, Husky, like, Dance Attic. Anywhere I could do a class, I would, like, save my money and invest in that and try to learn. Was there a genre that you really fell in love with immediately? Um, I'd say probably hip-hop, because... I was doing street jazz classes first in Luton. I thought that was hip-hop classes, which it wasn't. And I realised when I lived in France, and I was like, this isn't... I don't think this... Yeah, what I learned wasn't what I thought hip-hop was. And so then I kind of was on a quest to learn a bit more the real stuff. You've created work internationally and founded House of Absolute in 2014, a multidisciplinary powerhouse cultivating the preservation of wisdom within art. What was the driving force of founding House of Absolute? I was traveling a lot at that point. I traveled a lot to learn and learn lots of different styles of dance. Went to Israel, went to Germany, Austria, New York. I was competing around Europe quite a lot. Um, and I was just really trying to learn as many styles as possible of movement and, and also retrace my lineage from my teacher's teacher and kind of tracing where he'd learned movement and the different styles that I was learning from my teacher and then also trying to learn deeper and get more knowledge on the club styles and the street dance forms that I was learning also. Trying to get to the source of things. Um, I was always inspired travelling. I thought, how can I still get inspired when I'm in London or in UK? And I was, I was like, oh, I always need to travel. Here, people here are not pushing me or whatever, whatever. And, you know, whatever. I'm like saying to myself, but actually I was like, um, a good friend of ours passed away in, in the crew, a popping crew that um, I was part of. That kind of gave me a slap in the face to be like, do you know what, do it now. There's like no time to waste sort of thing. And I thought, do you know what, I just need people who are going to commit and who want to learn this style, whacking, which was what, and I thought, I 
what had happened is I was part of a whacking crew, which was part of a New York collective called IHOW, Emporia House of Whacking. And we were together for a short amount of time and it disbanded quite organically because we were so individual as people. Um, and so I was always trying to still continue this interest in this art form and style of dance um, within here and to cultivate something here. So I tried to, yeah, so that was kind of, I started just by messaging a few people, students that I taught or people that I'd seen in the club that I knew that were interested in the style. I said, do you want to do this? Just learn. I just need commitment and like an, an interest, genuine interest in the style. And it kind of started from then, organically grew to what House Absolute is now. As a creative director, choreographer, dance artist, how do you shift between these roles on a daily basis? I actually haven't performed myself for a few years. So on a stage, from maybe 2019, that was the last time I did it. I think it was v &A, it was the last show I did myself. Um, I've been focused a lot more on choreography and creative direction more. Although the performer in me is always like, I'm training that on my, on my own because it's really, I think it's really important to still be crafting my, my movement and understanding what the movement is for me so that I can explain it and, and demonstrate if I really need to in that rehearsal process or that space with, with dance artists or the company that I'm working with. I think it just shifts depending on the project and what the project needs and what the idea needs or what, what the intention is and then that role will shift. But essentially, it kind of like, I think it morphs and it translates into whatever you're doing anyway, and you have this title. But actually, how you approach is, is your approach and your way is your way. So I come from a performance point of view, I come from a creative direction view, I come from a choreography view, in all those different ways that there's different roles. When working with others and having a team, what is the most important thing for you um, from working in, with that community? I'm still on this search now to refine it in having a space where you can have kindness, respect, um, as equality in the space, even though we've all got different roles and there is some, type, you know, there's a degree of different, well, you want to say hierarchy, I don't want to say it like power hierarchy, but there is different, some people have the final say, you know, you have different people leading different visions, depending on what they're, medium is but my search and it still is in every project that I'm doing is how can you still have that kind of care in a room and still create the best work output and and that's I'm still finding that if you just focus fully on the work sometimes the people kind of get really burnt out and like you're rinsing the company and then sometimes you, you're so super so much like just about the people then you don't get the work to the quality that you want it to be and ultimately, for me, I'm just trying to find the process, the best process all the time to, to get the, the highest quality of work and um, human decency and like care and inspiration, mutual inspiration in, in a space. You were the choreographer behind the critically acclaimed musical Cabaret and you won Best Creative West End Debut as part of the Stage Debut Awards. What was the process like to creating cabaret and it's being revived revived isn't the right word but it's being restaged on broadway soon so from the beginning to now how is that i mean for me it always starts from what what were you saying like so whether it's an opera whether it's a musical theater whether it's straight dance choreography whether it's an immersive piece in v &A, whether it's a promenade, et cetera, site specific, whatever. Like, what, what are you saying? What's the intention of it? What's the story, if there's a story? What's the music? What's the music saying? What, what are you trying to translate um, and funnel through? So for me, because this, had a, this specific work had like set music or score, a bit like an opera, we have a set score and then a set script and storyline, loads of itiner iterations of it from before and past I really try to just go to the earliest point of music that I could find of it and, and hear, listen, really listen to like the first orchestrations of the live theatre pieces first. That was my process. Really just looking at the script on its own and reading it and really looking at the lyrics and the lyrical content and what I was saying in the lyrics as well as the script and the, and the kind of arc of the story. And then 
researching some of the things that came out for me as a, a human being now, listen, watching it and listening to it, was it evoking in me? What's the real thing that it's evoking in me? And then researching those feelings or images that came up for me when I was listening or reading or, or looking at some, of the, some, some existing footage of some things. Um, so there's little snippets of films. I haven't seen the whole film, but I've seen little snippets of that. I've seen the st different stage versions, photography. Then I started looking at the time frame of like where it's set and all that. Um, so that's, the, that's my, kind of own intern my, my own personal process of how I approach it. And then if you talk about the process of then like in the space and like collaboration of the creative team and then the artists, it's, um, I, I like to kind of, try and pull from who I'm working with, sculpt it, and, and, and also see what they bring from their body, from their mind, from their history, from their, their being, um, and see how they approach a feeling and, then, and, and, and shape it. And then also like listen to the director and see where the vision is from there, listen to the designer and see where those concepts have come from because they've been researched way deep as well. And then how can I translate that through the physicality? And then if it needs steps, it needs steps, you know? Uh, and then how do you and take it a step out and then make it feel organic or yeah for me it's really comes a lot from improvisation as well like my starting point and that's probably from me being like a freestyler and and also trying to catch I'm trying to catch that thing of what I said to you about getting quality work and care in a space and and, and marrying that and and the other thing I'm always looking at and on a constant search for is that presence of when you're in a club and you're like you're jamming with the DJ and you're just free in a space and there's loads of people around and you're just trying to and you have that flow state in yourself. That's what I'm always trying to find in any space that is in performance or out performance. I really try try to just be able to be myself because I used to always be like I can be free and this is why I like to dance because. I'm the most free then. Oh, I'm the most free when I dance. But how? I don't want to just be stuck and only free when I'm dancing. How can I learn from that and apply it to my everyday life? Because that's I'm doing that because I can't feel like that in my everyday life. So how can I apply that into my everyday life? So that's the constant <laughs> journey that I'm going through. Whatever project I'm doing, whatever thing I'm doing, like here now, like with the people here in the space, this space, you, like... I'm trying to find that all the time. And with the longevity of cabaret, how do you continue that momentum when it goes to new space, spaces mm. and places? Well, it's already, already existing yeah. in a long, let's like go into third year now. We have an amazing team. I have an amazing choreographic team as well who look after the work. And it's a whole army of people in the building who are looking after and making sure that happens. And I think... Yeah, ultimately, I'm there and I want to be there at parts of it, but I can't always be there. And then that comes with your team and, and the people that you work with to cultivate a way to kind of sh continue that expression and keep it going in the, with keeping the integrity of where it started as much as possible and evolving it as people come in and out. And as it crosses a different scene, then you, you're talking about different types of statements now if you go to America what you're saying in the work is means something different because you're in a completely different climate and different people and, and different history what you put on stage and what you're sharing with the audience means so, it can mean a lot of different things <laughs> as part of the Wells season program at Sadler's Wells in 2022 you created and premiered Warrior Queens mm -hmm. What was the process of creating this work? Warrior Queens literally started from like 2007 and it's still ongoing now. Like, I don't think it's finished <laughs> because every like different commission that I had, it was always trying to think about how it's going to be the full length production. So I was working on solo here or piece here. Or, and I, why I say 2007 is because I had a, a university, I was teaching at Roehampton University and I'd made a piece and it's called modern day Mulan <laughs> and it started from that of like me kind of investigating my feelings of being in a cipher and like a male dominated cipher and me trying to go into that circle and, and, and share what I have to share and, and match energy that that is in a that is in a, a club circle and and what I shift in that, that yin yang kind of energy and what, what it means to hold space 
with the music and and it's be true to yourself and explore whatever you're exploring within the style that you're you're doing I'm kind of like really nerding out and going out into it but what I mean is what your question was what I'm digressing a bit it was about the process oh yeah it's I'm fascinated that it started you know the duration of that process like and how process can change from piece to piece to depending on when you feel like it's evolved to to kind of what you're env envisaging yeah and, and where your life is, where you are in your life. I feel like it's, it, it involves a lot of things about my personal life and things and little stories within that and experiences without explicitly being like, this is my story. Like, it's influenced and inspired by a lot of people and, and, and then you cross over and you use other references like Orlando um, by Virginia Woolf or like Mulan, which is the, the Chinese myth folk story. And... and but now it's very different. So if you ask me about Warrior Queens now, that process has gone through like years and years. And now I'm going to go into another process, which is incubating again and coming back to the drawing board about what, what that is or not. And is it, do I dash, is, is, it, is it a dash thing or is it like keep pushing? Is it a new, a new work that still embodies those things in it but isn't called Warrior Queens? You know, those, yeah. That's where it's at <laughs> right now. When you think of company culture mm -hmm. and you're working, you've worked with so many different people and, and companies, what's your approach? It depends. If you're talking about an organisation that's supporting you as an artist individually and what your work is, I think that's a different thing. So like if you're joining a company and you're joining a company to like perform with that company. But ultimately, I think whatever you're doing, you don't want to compromise who you are as a person and how you whatever you need and how how you do things unless it's like parts that you really need to face to grow like and you're aware of it but in terms of like for example if you're an artist and you want to make work and you there's all these different theaters and, and dance houses that you want to approach your work to I think the first thing is that you want support you want to see it it's not about like begging at the doorstep of what they can give you I think it's about being really sure about what you want to say and what your work is about for one crafting and understanding what your expression is first because otherwise how can you explain it I think one and then also then you're saying to them what how can you support me to do this because I think there's such every organization has a different structure or, or way of doing things and sometimes it supports the artist at the forefront and it's artist led and sometimes it's building infrastructure this is our format how can you adapt to this which is then sometimes a bit of give and take. And I think, of course, we have to do that sometimes. But you, by asking questions to the people who are leading those programmes or artistic directing those organisations, I think you can ask and be like, what's that? What's that? What's the intention of the building? What are the values of that company? And, and then you can see whether that is the right ethos for you as an artist, us as artists, I say that rhetorically, and what can you give me as well? And if you really, and be really asking questions, being really transparent, clear of your communication, like, am I getting paid for this? If I'm not getting paid, all good, just tell me. If you're going to put me on the main stage, don't put me on the main stage and like I'm dry because I haven't had enough support to be there. If I'm not ready for that, I'm not ready for that. And I think that that's also a responsibility for programmers and organisations who are wanting to create... Um, support for artists which is great everyone has to do that but it's like how how do you find the best way to do it but then also if you get an opportunity you better work for it and do your best thing because everything even now social media all these things it's, everything is word of mouth still and that's the strongest form and your reputation is everything and, and not only just reputation it's like as a person just do your best and like when you do get an opportunity you give everything to it then you can just have no regrets. And that's just how I, that's how I try to live my life, like to just, just give everything as much as possible. Um, and, and then I can be like, I've done my best, look. Critics didn't like it, whatever, you know, like, or people didn't connect to it, okay. As an advocate for cross-disciplinary collaborations, mm -hmm. what do you hope to see for the future of arts and culture? I think it's happening already. There's loads of fusion and most organisations are going into this cross art form programming because I think actually le less like to share audiences and bring people into buildings because they need to survive as well 
So there's this kind of natural fusion that's happening across the industry, I feel, in terms of non-mainstream commercial stuff as well, although that kind of intersects as well. I'd love to see like artists get really good quality platforms and like stuff at, filmed and like photographed in a real sh slick, high quality way if they are getting the stuff done. Because then if they get a platform, the perform a 15 minute piece, for example, and you've got sick, sick footage of it or photography, then you can, you've got some assets to use for your next thing and then for your website and all those sort of things. So I think that that sort of support in anyone who's starting out would be really useful. And sometimes that's overlooked because you just you just need this money to be spent with artists and then we've, we've done hit that box of we've worked with five artists or six artists this year. And I'm not saying that that's what they do, but it is a part of it. If you look at like arts funding and how things need structure, it's like, okay, how, maybe it's the artist-led thing. It'd be great if like things are artist-led. And I know everyone's trying to do that and have more conversations now. You're a mother mm. and a freelance artist. And it's important to you to advocate for parents and increase true visibility and experience. What's the key to creating a supportive network for working parents within the industry? I don't think there's a key. Like, I wouldn't say there's one thing, but I think one thing everyone could do is just ask people how is it working for you right now? Like, how are you doing? How's this first process? Why are you being a mother now? What, what do you, is there anything that you need, anything we can support you with? Sometimes it's just asking and not assuming, and I think that goes a long way. Um, and, and offering and just opening that conversation up is really useful. I wouldn't say that. I, I'm still learning. It's, I'm only a year into it. But I definitely notice people who are very like aware or sensitive to it to ask, and then I notice it if some people are like, "Oh, we can't, we got no, but we, we just literally can't do that." Because I was like, "Okay, cool, well then." But and also, I think from that side, but there's also the side of parents to to be really clear and be like, "I need this to be able to do it," and if I, if not, that's cool. I won't do it then. Government policies and regulations can significantly impact the freelance landscape. Is there a support there that's been beneficial? There are less things for freelancers out there, less support systems. If you have a company, there are frameworks, there are things that perks of joining a company, right? And when you're freelance, you just have to find things and like find out things for yourself, or you hear from word of mouth of things. Otherwise, I'd, well, I don't really know much support that's out there. I don't feel that there's governmental support for it. And that, that's as a freelance artist, but I think everyone who's a freelance self-employed person doesn't have those things. And I don't, I don't know how to kind of tackle that really. I, you just kind of, I feel like you just have to work harder and like, and put things aside and, and have some more foresight to, to be a bit more thinking ahead of what you might have as an emergency because you won't have a company to back you up to, to support you in those things. You don't have holiday pay, you don't have sick pay and those sort of things if you're not on payroll. So then if you're not working, you don't earn. It's all those things. You don't have pension plans. Like you, Then you have to go to a different private company to get those things. Uh, tax, all those sort of things. You've got to learn about it. <laughs> get a specialist to like learn about it um, or do your own research. And in terms of mentors mm -hmm. have you had people in your life career that have supported you i spoke to you about stuart thomas who's my um when i was 23 i did an open class in contemporary dance and thereafter he took me under as his student there's one time i was said to him oh you know i, I won't see you this week because i don't have money for class or and he was just like no just come you know just come as much as you need to come and Ever since I've never really, pay, I've never paid for class. He just openly, like so open on, generous, and saw something in me, and that also kind of drove me to have more self belief, also to learn form and kind of like contemporary dance form, which I wasn't schooled in, and gave me a drive to be like, do you know what, I can do this. I'm 23. I'm, I'm starting late, but. I'll go to New York and I'll learn that and I'll try and go here and learn that. And his teacher went to Israel, so I'll go to Israel and I'll, I'll learn that company and see what drove him to go there, you know. 
And so, yeah, I, I learned a lot, a lot from Stuart. And he, he's still my teacher now, he's still my mentor. And he's very philosophical and I love the way he thinks and he's very caring and, and has got so much knowledge. He's like a massive library in his body. So ever since I started a career in the arts, I've been asked about the lack of representation within the industry. It's made me a socially conscious artist mm. and motivated to create Cameo. Are there any assumptions about being a female artist that you would like to set straight? I guess I don't know what people assume about female artists, so it's hard for me to say that. All I can say is, as a British Chinese artist, I think if I look at the stereotyping of what people, how people stereotype Chinese people, East Asian looking people, there's, there's those stereotypes. And, there's, and then I guess there's like people who are, you don't often see. Well, actually, I think it's changing a lot more. Like seeing women in positions of power, or positions of like authority and, and, and changing that up. And it's difficult to say because for me, like I do work with a lot of companies and creative teams which have a lot of women in it now. And if I'm working on a team, I try to, well, naturally, I feel kind of instinctively I want to bring these people and they tend to be women or women of, or people of different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds. And so that's, that's a conscious thing that I, I, I want in the room because when I go into rooms of productions, um, big productions, I, I'm often like, I, you can just quickly see that, you know, I'm maybe the only ethnic minority in that room or, you know, and I, I think that needs to change. I, w I want that to change. I want to see myself and I want to see my peers and my friends in all the rooms that I'm in, just how I am with my own company and when I say company not business company but like just my, my peers my friends I want to see that in all the places that I'm working in and and then, and then when I don't see it, I'm like oh I wonder why there isn't that I think just creating more visibility and seeing that is is important and that leads me perfectly onto my final question which is what would you like your legacy to be I think it's of anything I would I would love that People have had good interactions with me, have learned something or learned something about themselves or like been able to be their true self in, in the space that I'm holding and that there's quality work <laughs> as well. And that's part, part of my kind of thing about really caring about whatever I put out there. It's really good quality. But if I really, yeah, good work, good quality work. An exp a good experience of, of being together. That, that would be nice. I'd like to take a moment to thank English National Ballet for hosting this conversation at the Mulrine Centre for Dance in London.